Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. North Dakota Insurance Commissioner John Godfrey joins me now. John, I was just I was just uh, watching some tweets about your uh, campaign announcement, which you just uh, I imagine completed uh, minutes ago, uh, and everybody talking about uh, the tallest. Do you get tired of everybody talking about you being the tallest politician? Are you sick of that yet? And I, the reason I say that is because I'm a Yankees fan, and I've been watching the Yankees Astro series, and in the postseason. It's like all the sports people want to talk about. Oh, Aaron Judge is super tall, right fielder for the Yankees. And Jose Altuve, second in baseman for the Astros, is really short. And we go on and on about this. It's like, I get it. They're super tall. Can we move on? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. I mean, I think it's something I've, I've dealt with my entire life. I mean, it's, uh, I, I've been fortunate to be tall uh, all the way through. I mean, I was head and shoulders above everybody in my kindergarten photo, so. Uh, it's certainly something that I've, I've become accustomed to and used to. And, you know, this, this world, uh, tallest politician stuff is, is, has been a lot of fun. It, it's been fun. Uh, yeah, know, it has. I didn't know, I didn't really know it was a thing. Uh, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, it, and it's also an opportunity to, to again, highlight what we do at the insurance department. Because the reality is a lot of people don't know that the insurance department exists or that there's an insurance commissioner out there that can help. And so if this, if this helps drive a little more awareness, that's, that's a, an added bonus. Yeah. And it's also a fun fun process yeah it's uh what uh what 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 does the insurance commissioner do exactly and i guess hey let's let's make that our first serious question of the interview yeah. what have you done so, oh, what, 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 what have you done over the last four years to uh, commend you to re-election well I, I guess you know i'll start with what the what the insurance commissioner's role is is uh primarily we're a we're a consumer protection agency so we're uh, we're the agency that steps in between uh, an insurance company and the consumer if there's an issue. And so consumers can call us and say, hey, my insurance company isn't treating me fairly, or hey, uh, I don't think I'm getting reimbursed on this claim appropriately. Uh, can you guys take a look? And then we can work with the insurance company on the, so- on, on the back end to say, let's take a look, let's take a review, and see if we can come to some meaningful settlement. Uh, it's a really good service for our consumers because insurance is complex. And generally the minute you pick up the phone call, pull up the phone to call your insurance company, you're probably at a disadvantage because the reality is they deal with it on an everyday basis. And generally as a consumer, we don't deal with insurance until we need it. So I, I don't, I mean, even as a insurance commissioner, I don't sit around and think about my homeowner's insurance or my auto insurance on a daily basis. But yeah. if I get into an accident or have a hailstorm, I'm, I'm going to run to my policy to make sure it's there and then, then have to get into a, a discussion with my insurance company and, uh, that can be frustrating at times for consumers, and so uh, they're able to turn that over to us, and we're able to advocate on their behalf with the with the companies and and come to a fair settlement and make sure that those those promises that our companies are making to our consumers are, are being upheld. And so that's that's our primary focus. Uh, but we also license all the insurance agents in the state. Uh, they've got to go through a testing process and a background check to uh, to be able to sell insurance in our state. Uh, and then we also license the companies, and so we've got to make sure that they're financially sound and able to pay for the promises that they're making. And so it, there's a lot of yeah. pieces to it, a lot of uh, touches on it. But well, it's, that's, uh, it's that's, a, that's a point it's, I wanted to make too, is I don't think a lot of people, when, when we think about the insurance department, I think a lot of people think health insurance. I think even when you mentioned the yep. term insurance, because health insurance has been such a policy bug bugaboo for, for a long time. I mean, just nationally, mm-hmm. locally, it's health insurance is on a lot of people's mind, much more so, I think, than other, like, auto insurance. I mean, generally, yeah. auto insurance is not the public policy problem. It seems like we got that squared. There's a thriving competitive market. Most people are able to find insurance. I'm sure there's, there's, I'm sure there's, like any area of public policy, there's probably things we could do better. But for the most part, it seems like we have that figured it out, and it's working pretty well. Health insurance is not working very well, I think. But, but your office handles all of it, uh, all types yeah, of we, insurance. We, you know, we, we handle, and as a state-based regulator, we handle every line of insurance. And, and I like to say generally except for uh, health insurance to a, to a little bit and then flood insurance. Those are both have some pretty heavy federal involvement. Uh, and in my opinion, there's, there's, it's no coincidence that those are generally areas we have the most disagreement and the most issues with. Uh, every other line we've, we've delegated to the states to, to effectively manage and regulate and run. 
uh, why we can't get that with the, the health care or health insurance or even flood insurance, you know, that's, again, a, an ongoing discussion we're having with Congress about turning some more of that control back over to the state to allow us to make decisions for our consumers. Um, but, again, that's an ongoing discussion. But you're, you're absolutely right. Right now, health insurance is, the, is the, the main driver of the discussion when you talk about insurance. That may not always be that way. Um, you know, I think with autonomous vehicles coming forward and, and how we're going to insure vehicles when they become autonomous, whether that's 10, 15, 20 years down the road, I think that'll be a pretty heavy transition and a pretty interesting discussion along the way. But certainly in the last decade and, and probably yeah. even longer, health insurance has been the top billing when we talk insurance. It's it's funny to even talk about that stuff. I'm, I'm watching these YouTube videos out of California where people are like falling asleep in their Tesla because it's here. Like tes- <laughs> Tesla's yeah. have you get on the highway, your Tesla can drive itself. And it's, I, I mean, it's, the, it's a problem in California where people are like falling asleep on their commute, where other people are filming them and they're sleeping behind the wheel and their cars driving them down the highway. I, I've had the opportunity to go out to California and, and be on the Google campus and kind of look at some of their, their autonomous vehicle stuff. Um, I'll tell you, they're further along than I thought they'd be. And I, and I thought they'd be pretty far along. Um, but there's one thing that's kind of saving grace for us here in North Dakota at this point is they have no idea how to deal with snow. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the, it, it completely the screws up their sensors and they yeah. don't, they don't know what to do with, with the, the heavy snowfall. Yeah. Um, but, but I also agree. I also say, you know, as far as autonomous vehicles goes, I'll be the, I would like to be able to be the first one that, that has an autonomous vehicle because I would love to turn over, uh, that responsibility because, you know, about 90, some 90, some percent of the crashes that happen are due to human error. Yeah. And so if we can figure out a way to, uh, safely implement this autonomous vehicle, uh, concept, you know, it, it not only could save lives, but I think it also changes our whole automotive industry, which sure. uh, it, it'll change how cars look. It'll change. We, we may not even have our ownership. It'll just be more of a fleet model where I'll just type in my phone and say, I need a ride to work and a car will show up. Yeah. Uh, which then I can, I can turn my garage into a man cave and, and you know, put a big screen <laughs> wow, TV in there and have a great time. Getting, you were putting the <laughs> cart in front of the horse, my friend. I think you're a little <laughs> far, you're a little far ahead of yourself. Uh, although I may need to talk to your wife about how badly you want this man cave. And this is how far just, just give him a, just give him a, just give him a, a man cave. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny cause, but that has implications for insurance. Cause you don't even think about that. Yep. If, if I'm not driving, Right, like if 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 my car manufacturer has essentially taken over and and their artificial intelligence or programming or whatever whatever the heck it is has taken over driving, am I still liable? Yeah. Like if it gets into well, an accident, that's, I mean I, that's that, that's the question, right? If two autonomous vehicles hit each other, who's at fault? And and and, uh, and so I, and I think that's where that discussion and that whole the the way our auto insurance is currently sold and currently marketed and 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 attached to the drivers and the cars is going to be completely different because I think it's going to go, if you ask me to look at my crystal ball, I think it's going to go to more of a fleet model. Uh, Now that'll certainly impact the urban areas much quicker. Like in Singapore, they do it right now where you can, uh, you can drive to the outskirts of the the Singapore, the main, the main urban area. And at that point, then it's, it's all autonomous vehicles on the inside. Um, And and so you've got to park your car at a a park and go place. And then you, you, you hop in the car and go wherever you need to go. Uh, that's probably the transition we'll be looking at, but we may get to a point eventually again where automobile ownership will be different. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll still have the guys who are the kind of the gearheads and, and, and want to own those those uh, classic cars and, and all that stuff going forward, but how those are insured may be very, very different. And yeah. so, I, like I said, so I think as of, as of right now, certainly and probably for the foreseeable future, uh, health insurance is a big talking point, but we've got a lot of other areas uh, with this new technology that's coming forward in the insurance industry uh, that that will, I think, it's going to elevate the insurance industry to probably uh, some pretty interesting discussions. Let's talk about your first term in office. Um, sure. You were elected in 2016, so of course you're up for re-election now here in 2020 or the 2020 cycle, I should say. Um, what have you accomplished during your first four years? So uh, the first thing I really wanted to do when I got into office was to uh, try to elevate the the awareness the public's awareness of that this office exists. Uh, I learned pretty quickly on the campaign trail last time that there aren't a whole lot of people that understand just what services the insurance department provides. And, and so we've done a, a concerted effort on trying to do more outreach and just being more a part of the public discussion uh, on, on insurance, on health insurance, on all of the different lines of insurance. Uh, it's something that we still need to continue to work on and we still need to grow. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud of that work that we've, we've moved there. Uh, <coughs> I'm also happy with the, the reinsurance program we just passed this last session. 
which provides a, about a 20% reduction for uh, folks on the individual market who've got to go out and purchase their own health insurance. Uh, yeah. That 20% reduction is critical. And, and so that's generally for those farmers, those ranchers, those, those small business owners who yeah. don't have access to a large group market. They find they're finally getting some relief because they've been they've been taking the brunt of the year over year rate increases from the ACA, and they don't receive a subsidy. They don't receive any kind of assistance, and, and so the ability to be able to bring in some relief for them, I think, is critical to help keep them insured and to help keep that you know that that tough discussion that I know some of our farmers are having is, boy, I don't know if I can afford health insurance this year, or we got to sell X number of head of cattle to to pay for our health insurance, or at, at the, the scariest point is, you know what, nobody got sick last year. Let's just not have it and see how it goes. Uh, that's a that's a very dangerous game to play, in my opinion. And so, uh, working with the state legislature and 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 their you know uh, their support, we've been able to provide some relief for that for those individuals. Which I think is, is very impactful. Well, let's. Um, I, I, I want to you know, drill down on this a little because I think this is a big deal, especially now. I mean, it's no, nobody could. I mean, the agriculture markets are what they are. North Dakota is an agriculture yep. state. We understand the the commodities roller coaster. The weather has not cooperated with us and then we have some national politics involved with china and all that so it's it's been it's been a rough year and it's it's going to be a rough fall and and a rough winter for our our farmers and and probably a tough spring too uh right now since most of them are on the individual market i think that's a safe thing to say uh they uh a 20 percent reduction in their costs is a big deal so how did you do that i mean i I know you you said the legislature what i mean what what was the mechanism that, that that allowed insurers to lower the so, rates that far so it's a reinsurance program and reinsurance is, is been around as long as insurance has been around it's enough it's basically insurance for insurance companies um and, and so what that does is it, it helps us take out some of the outliers uh so the, the folks who maybe have a very medically complicated year or high claims cost year uh it, it helps them it provides some relief for our companies to, for them so as you can imagine as you're building a rate if you got a couple outliers who have a, all of a sudden a four million dollar claims year, that impacts the rest of the market. And what we found with our study is that you know about 0.24 percent of North Dakotans would fall into the reinsurance uh, attachment point essentially, so within the reinsurance program. So it's a very very small percentage of North Dakotans who have those high claims cost year. But as you can see with the program that we implemented, it has a very big impact on the rates, and that's something we've kind of always anecdotally known that there is. There's a small number of people who have a, a medically complicated year or have a high claims cost year, and that drives the rates to the rest of us. And so if we can kind of take those peaks out of the marketplace and provide some more assistance there, it can dramatically bring down the rates for everybody else. And so uh, this program, is, it, it, it is through the ACA. It's, a, it's one of the, they call it a state innovation waiver that you can get. I don't necessarily agree with that, that term because there's really no innovation in it. You can't, there's nothing, there's no flexibility offered by the federal government to, to do anything kind of creative. Um, but we looked at, we, we did a study on what this would do to North, for North Dakota, um, brought that forward to the legislature and, 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 you know, they supported it and brought it forward. And, and now we're seeing the fruits of that, that legislative session coming in this next 2020 plan year. Uh, when we just released the rates on October 1st, you know, we, we, we showed that 20% reduction on the individual marketplace, which, which will have a, a great deal of impact for, again, our farmers, ranchers, and small business owners. For, for people listening to this wondering, well, what am I going to see that? When, when, when is that going to show up in their their bill? So it'll show up when they when they go shopping uh, in, for their for their plan for the 2020 plan year that goes into effect January one of 2020. Uh, certainly encourage everybody to go out and look and shop for these different plans because uh, the plans are somewhat the same between the carriers, but the prices will be a little bit different. Uh, so it's important to go out and see what your options you have available, and that uh, generally I encourage folks to go through a, a licensed insurance agent to do that. Uh, you can also go on healthcare.gov to, to to get those price quotes. But as a consumer, they have to, nothing has to be done on the consumer side. It's all done on the back end between the insurance companies and the insurance department. So the only thing that consumers can see is that reduced rate starting effective January 1, 2020. A lot of people don't don't shop for insurance that way. Um, I, I People shop for auto insurance that way. It seems like every few yep. years I go... You know, looking around to see if I can get a better rate. I usually stay right where I'm at, but I like to look around just see if I can save some money. Um, most people don't do that. Most people have my my health insurance is through my employer, not shopping around because it's I'm not probably going to find anything better 
on the individual market than that. Do you think that's a problem where, where most people don't shop around? I mean, I think it's common in North Dakota because of the realities. We have a lot of self-employed people here. Agriculture, you know, mm-hmm. is a big part of that. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in North Dakota, you know, so a lot of people are shopping for their own insurance, but that's not typical. Most people aren't. As a matter of fact, most North Dakotans, even even in a state like ours, most yep. North Dakotans are not uh, in the individual marketplace. Should that change? About, about 8% of us are, are on the individual market. So 8% of North Dakotans actually have to go out and shop for that insurance. So you, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a small number of folks who've got to who've got to go out and actually have that discussion and, and shop. But I think it's an important piece for them uh, to go out and do that. Um, you know, should that change? Should that structure change? Should the insurance be tied to your employer and, and all those discussions? You know, I'm not really sure how, how we how we change that at this point. Um, but what I would like to see is, is more engagement by our consumers. Uh, you know, whether that's through an HSA, an FSA, or, or some of these different health savings accounts that we can have, that puts the consumer's money back in their pocket. And it also gives them the ability to have that discussion with their provider, uh, you know, because as I'm spending my own money, uh, it'll be, do I really need this test? Or is there a cheaper way to go about doing this? Or is this necessary? And having that discussion at the provider level, I think, is something that we're kind of missing in this country. And so the more control we can give back to consumers to, to have that discussion with their doctors and their providers, I think that helps put the pressure, the downward pressure on our health our care costs. But the, the problem with that is, I think people have gotten so used to uh, the current format that they've got, the current the current way that they go about it. Um, you know, I can I can tell you half the time what what an office visit would call if I or cost if I went to the doctor, uh, and I get the EOB and I can look through it and I can navigate and figure that out. But the average North Dakotan probably isn't going into that detail and looking at that. They're just going to the doctor, paying their thirty dollar copay or forty dollar copay or whatever their copay is, and and just you know moving forward. <clears throat> That's a big problem in our in my in my my opinion in the system is that. Our consumers don't know what it costs uh, to receive that health care. And ultimately, that health care cost, what it's costing to receive those services, is driving our health insurance rates because the, the underlying thing we're having is going up at a dramatic rate. So is our health insurance. And so I, I think the ACA puts the target squarely on the back of the insurance companies. And I think you're seeing even now with the Trump administration and, and even a study we're doing here in North Dakota that uh, the focus is somewhat shifting now to the providers to have that discussion about, okay, why does it cost so much to receive health care in this country? And there, very, there could be very valid reasons, but we've, we've got to unpack that and we've got to take a look at that. And is there areas that we can yeah. either get more collaboration or, or some policy changes that can, can lighten that burden? Because if the cost of health care is going to continue to go up, so is our health insurance. Well, I, I, I think you're right. I, I would rather, I mean, it, it always chills me a little bit, the idea of the government coming in and asking, you know, why are you charging so much? It's not up for the government to fix. You know, I don't think the government should be fixing yep. the price of uh, a CAT scan any more than they should be fixing the price of bread. Uh, it should just be what it is. And, Absolutely. And, and the, the marketplace can sort those things out. I think the problem is the marketplace is distorted. And wherever we see that, we see prices yep. spiral out of control. We could go down a, a, a path here and talk about college tuition rates. We've gone through the roof. <laughs> what, what's enabled that? Well, there's a little bit of a disconnect between you know the cost of attending higher education. We've, we've essentially turned getting a college loan into an entitlement in this country, and yep. that's caused problems. But anyway, that's I'm, I'm digressing. So, I, I mean, there, there's some real accomplishments here, though. I'm, I'm looking at your press release for your campaign you mm-hmm. you you talked about raising the stature of your office you're talking about lowering premiums for north dakotans and you've done that and along the way you also cut your office's budget the insurance yep. commission's budget by seven and a half percent what did you do there uh, so what we did is we came in uh you know and i'll give some credit to governor Burgum, and, and he challenged every agency to come in and say okay give us a 90 percent budget and what does that mean uh, so that took that that gave us an opportunity to take a look at what we do as the insurance department, and and our job is consumer protection and insurance industry regulation. Uh, we had some other pieces, whether it's inspecting boilers or or running an underground petroleum tank storage fund, um, or frankly even selling insurance uh, that that I didn't feel really fit with our mission, and so we were able to bring it bring some discussion forward to the legislature to say. You know, the boiler inspections probably fit better with the Department of Environmental Quality. They're a public safety agency. That's what they do. Um, maybe they should go over there. Uh, the Underground Petroleum Tank Fund uh, is generally managed by the DEQ. We just, we, we oversee the fund and we, we end up making the payments out of that fund. But it probably makes more sense to move that over to DEQ. And then the last one is probably the thing I'm the most proud of is that uh, since, in, since state inception, we've had the State Fire and Tornado Fund and our State Bonding Fund. These are essentially government insurance, and so it's, it's where state government goes to get insurance. 
that was being run through the insurance department for the last hundred plus years. Um, you know, we asked the question of, does it make sense as a regulator that we're also selling insurance? And, and it's a very, and to me, it's, it's, it's been a very unhealthy relationship. It's a very, uh, it's a tenuous area, right? And so we, we partnered with the North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund, who is a, 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 it's a quasi-private entity. It's a private entity run by uh, nonprofits who they provide insurance to all the other political subdivisions except for the state and said, why can't you do the same service for the state? And they said, well, it's, it's in a law that we are barred from offering this. And so we changed that law, uh, turned that over, and, and the DERF uses private agents and the private market to, uh, to sell this insurance. So it was an opportunity for us to get out of the way and, and, frankly, turn this back over to the private market, which makes a heck of a lot more sense, and it's going to be better service, it's going to be better coverage uh, for, for our government entities, and without having it having being run by the regulator. Because the reality is the only people that audit us are the auditor, and we, you know, and, and when we go and inspect and, and examine insurance companies, uh, we, we take a different look at it. And so we, we audit and uh, examine North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund just like we do every other company. And so now this fund will be underneath that, that kind of umbrella and we'll be able to take a good hard look at it uh, and make sure we're doing it right and providing the best, the best coverage and the best service we can for our government entities. Because the reality is whether I'm a government entity or a private individual, I really want my insurance agent to be my insurance agent. And through the use of the North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund, we're putting the professionals back into that conversation. The private agents are going to get back into that discussion and be able to have that discussion with our government entities to ensure that we're properly protected. Last question. You're obviously campaigning for another four years. What do you want to do with those four years? I mean, looking ahead, what, what, pro, what, I mean, what, what do you still want to tackle? Well, we still haven't solved the air ambulance issue. Um, that, that's a big, big piece for me uh, that, that, that I think is a, is a very – um, it's a, there's a common sense solution that sits out there that, that is sitting before Congress right now that they could pass the Lower Health Care Costs Act and solve this problem. Uh, we tried to do that here in North Dakota in 2017. We're in the middle yeah. of a lawsuit uh, to, to kind of uphold that, that law. For those who aren't, the air ambulance issue is essentially where uh, if you, and, you know, and especially in a rural state like North Dakota, I mean, we got a lot of people who live a long, long way from services like hospitals so if you have you, know, you get in a car accident or you have some sort of a health emergency they'll send in a helicopter to come get you but the cost of that can be ruinous i mean tens of thousands so it's, of dollars it's, and it's not necessarily yeah. covered by your insurance in fact is it covered by any insurance policy i guess i don't know so we've got we've got nine nine air ambulance companies that provide service in our state about six of those have got great relationships with our insurance companies, our in-network, and, and there's no balance billing that comes from that. We've got three what I like to consider probably kind of bad actors that, that actively uh, are, are kind of willfully out of network because they use this balance billing method as a business model. So essentially, uh, as a consumer, if I'm laying by the side of the road because of an accident, uh, dispatch and EMT are calling an air ambulance because I need that life-saving service. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, not, you're not shopping around air ambulance companies at that point. I, <laughs> I'm not even probably conscious when the right. decision is being made. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I've got an $80,000 balance bill on the back end on the back end of a pretty significant health crisis that needed an air ambulance ride. Uh, you can certainly see how that leads to financial ruin, and that is, that is completely unfair to our consumers because, again, it's not a decision that they're making. And, and so... We've got to figure that out, and I think we, we have the solution here in North Dakota in 2017, but we, were, we got overturned uh, in our district court by a federal airline deregulation act, which is, we can kind of get into some legal arguments there if you really yeah. want to, but the long and the short of it is we still got to solve that problem. We still got to fix that. And so that's one area we're going to continue to work on. Uh, I also think, obviously, the healthcare discussion will continue and what healthcare reform maybe comes forward, how it looks like, and, and what, if anything, changes with the next election cycle. Um, but lastly, I think the, the growth of technology and how our consumers are interacting with insurance is, is going to change over the next five to ten years pretty dramatically. And, and as much, I think, as everybody wants the, the technology to come forward and, and really interact with this, this industry, you know, as, as the insurance commissioner, uh, everything's going to be great until it's not. And so we're, we're doing our best to stay on the front end of this and, and, and make sure we're asking those questions to, to ensure that that consumer protection remains, even with the growth of artificial intelligence, even with the growth of the use of blockchain and some of this stuff. Uh, and so I think it's, it's a really fascinating time to be part of the industry because we're at the cusp of a pretty, pretty big uh, technology shift here. I think the financial services industry went through that. You know, now we can do online checking, online banking, and, and all that stuff. <clears throat> the insurance industry is just kind of at the, at the forefront, at the beginning of that big 
big transition and it's a it's a great time to be a part of it and, and frankly i've been uh, able to kind of move into some leadership roles on the national level uh, by the chair of the innovation technology and ta- uh, task force and the artificial intelligence working group for our national association so uh, it, it's fun to have a front row seat at this technology growth and this change uh, because i think it's going to have a pretty big impact on our consumers going forward john thanks for your time yeah thanks rob anytime